Uh, thank you for coming. Um, so, I guess the schedule is uh, nine, well, now until noon, um, and we can stick a break in there somewhere. Um, I guess that's up to us or me. And uh, so this is, this is not a tutorial in the sense of you trying things out while I'm standing up here, um, uh, but it's still not a, just a lecture, so I hope there's um, possible to have questions and, and discussions, although I'll try to keep that from getting too out of hand, as I'm sure it could easily uh, get. So, um, first of all, thanks to Jonathan Bona uh, for doing the work that uh, adds the M part in a serious way to, to glare, um, and for help with this tutorial. And you should all think of him uh, positively, because within a week after I get back to Buffalo, he'll be defending his dissertation, finally. Um, so um, the outline is um, first a partial review of the keynote talk. I'll go through that quickly, but it'll, again, give you a chance to ask questions if there's some clarification you need. But let's try to uh, put off um, deep arguments uh, until later to just make sure we can get through the other material. Uh, and then um, the main part of this will be an example and I've chosen uh, uh, as the example agent, the delivery agent, um, which I prepared as an example uh, some time ago and, and sort of resurrected for this, this talk. Um, it's not an extremely complicated agent, but I think there's enough there to get into some um, interesting techniques about how we go about um, building agents uh, in mGlare. And then so I'll use the example, developing the delivery agent, as a motivation for getting into some side excursions uh, on the theory and, and use of SNPs and mGlare, rather than first all theory and then example. So uh, again, as I said, uh, the, the beliefs, the mind of some agent, of some single agent, um, and so the beliefs in there our beliefs of that agent. And I've always started off the first day of my KR talks, uh, KR courses, by saying the field is really misnamed. It should be belief representation and reasoning, not knowledge representation and reasoning, because whether or not any of these beliefs are true in the world is a matter of science, and, and that's not the sort of thing that we worry about, I think. Um, so it's first person reasoning uh, and online acting and sensing. Um, that is, we haven't really, in my group, gotten into planning in a real serious sense, uh, but it's, um, it's acting and reasoning as it goes along. The layers of this architecture, of, as I said, are motivated by issues of mind-body connections and distinctions, and um, uh, we want to be, or we can take the same mind and plug it into different bodies. In fact, that's the case that's been the case recently with the delivery agent um, because John's been using a different body for it than, than I have. Um, and another motivation was this issue of embodiment, um, which I see as the issue of where is the origin of our beliefs. Some are certainly talking to other people and reading books and documents and, and texts but others are in the sensations and proprioceptions of our own body, um, as I said before. And uh, an agent, including us, uh, have uh, first-person privileged knowledge of one's own body. And the other is situatedness, which I'm not really going to get into much uh, today, uh, but that is uh, the agent having a sense of where it is in the world. Um, and uh, I was challenged once to think more seriously about uh, what, it, what is a symbol for those of us who are in the, the symbol processing school of AI. 
Um, and I see it as a pivot, in a sense, between various modalities. Um, so the symbol is what holds uh, the sensing and, and expression of some entity uh, constant across modalities. Uh, so the motivation for modalities uh, are their independent but limited resources um, that uh, in which are the sensors and effectors uh, of the agent. Different modalities can be used independently of each other, mostly, um, uh, but a single modality has limited use. Um, and this is the picture I, sh I showed the other day of the, our, our latest way of picturing the M-glare architecture, the layers being rings uh, of the circle, high being in the center, and the, what I think of as high being in the center and low being uh, at the edge, which is the world on the outside. Um, and then there are various sensors and various effectors, uh, each in its own modality that cuts across uh, at least some of the layers. So the sensory actuator level, uh, those are the sensor and effector controllers. Um, on a software robot, they're what come with the robot simulation or that we build into the robot simulation. On a hardware robot, they're what comes with the hardware. Uh, the perceptual motor layer, uh, the idea of a three-layered architecture seems, right? It's got to be a three-layer architecture, but somehow this layer is divided into three sub-layers. Uh, one of which is now split in half, so um, two sublayers and one pair of half sublayers. Uh, the PMLC um, essentially abstracts the sensors and effectors into the basic body repertoire, bodily repertoire, um, and is specific to the implementation of the body on either a, a software or hardware robot. PMLB translates between uh, the higher uh, split layer of PML and PMLC, uh, and it's the highest level that knows, the highest layer that knows the body implementation. Um, so if we switch a mind to a new body, uh, then we have to replace PMLB um, and below, although the API, the way PMLB is called from the PMLA, remains the same. But what it does uh, can be different. Then the, uh, what I just referred to as PMLA is actually split into PMLA and PMLS. PMLS, S for sensation, um, uh, is the top layer for um, the afferents, that is the sensing uh, modalities. Um, and it grounds uh, knowledge layer symbols in perceptual structures. Um, and it, with its companion PMLA, is the lowest layer that that knows the knowledge layer representation. Um, and it has, or probably has these days, since John hasn't really addressed this very much, um, deictic registers which are used for this situatedness that I talked about, um, and modality registers uh, which are used for knowing what the body is up to at the moment. And PMLA is the effector side. Uh, it it's, um, grounds KL symbols for actions and uh, implementations of those actions. Um, and it, with its companion, is the lowest layer that knows the KL terms. And again, has or may have the deictic registers and modality registers. Um, Finally, the knowledge layer um, is implemented in SNAPS, and that's what we've done the most work on uh, in my group and, and myself. It's implemented in SNAPS, contains the agent's beliefs, representations of conceived of entities that the agent has thought of. It holds both semantic memory and episodic memory for those agents that have a model of time. I'll say more about that uh, a little later. Uh, quantified and conditional beliefs, that is, um, propositions that are like uh, quantified and, and formulas in, in predicate logic and with connectives. Uh, plans for non-primitive acts, I'll show you how those are constructed. Plans to achieve goals, 
beliefs about preconditions and effects of acts, um, and policies, these are these conditions for performing an act, um, self-knowledge and meta-knowledge. So that's all there, just lumping them together rather than dividing it up in the architecture. Looking at afferent modalities, uh, they start at the sensors, uh, get translated to perceptual structures. Uh, at the PMLS, gets translated to uh, perception happens, and they get translated to KL terms. And I'll show a little more details of that today than I did earlier in the week. And efferent modalities go the other way. Uh, so uh, there are KL primitive acts. Those are implemented by PMLA functions, procedures, methods, what have you, uh, to act impulses that go down uh, the modality and eventually to the effectors when something actually happens. Uh, OK, so I said all of that earlier, this two days ago, as well as uh, what's upcoming. So um, mental entities, uh, so that's what the agent is thinking about. Uh, right, everything it thinks about is some mental entity. Um, and these include propositions. So propositions are first class uh, members of the domain of discourse, which is the domain of mental entities or intentional objects, intentional with an S. Um, and when I'm explaining propositions to my students, I, I point out that the way to tell something's a proposition is that it's possible to believe it. It makes sense to talk about believing it or believing the negation of it. And if it fits that frame, then it's a proposition. Um, and those include quantified and, and conditional beliefs. Uh, acts. Um, acts are the things one does, as opposed to the things one believes. Right? So acts are um, basically the things, the entities that an agent can perform. It can certainly think about acts that it can't do to the extent it has knowledge about them, uh, but the basic uh, notion of an act is something an agent can do. Um, I started off getting upset in, in some level of people working on planning systems and coming out with a sequence of, uh, of actions, but that the planning system itself couldn't carry them out. They were always planning for someone else to do them. And I thought, well, the real characteristic of an act is you can do it. So if we have an agent thinking about acts, it, there should be acts that it can actually perform. How else do you know it's an act as opposed to some other kind of entity? Uh, and policies um, turn out to be neither acts nor propositions. They're condition action rules that an agent can adopt. Um, so, whoops. Uh, so, for example, if the fire alarm rings, leave the building, that's not a proposition. That's a policy. You can't, it doesn't make sense to say it is not the case that if the fire alarm rings, leave the building. It does make sense to say it's not the case that if the fire alarm rings, you should leave the building. But if the fire alarm rings, you should leave the building is a proposition. If the fire alarm uh, rings, leave the building is a policy. Uh, and then everything else I'm lumping under thing. So those include actions. That is, an act is an action performed on some objects. Um, categories are included in the domain uh, of discourse. Categories or classes, whatever you want to call it. And everything else, individuals, properties of individuals, times, anything else that you or these agents can conceive of um, that's not a proposition, an act, or a policy. For now, I'm just lumping together under thing. Okay, and as I said before, I, I, it's not clear, it's a good time to, to ask. Um, there are objects in the world, there are terms in the SNEPS language, in the SNEPS formal language, uh, and if you read most KR presentations, um, they say that these terms denote these things 
in the world, or sets of those things, or functions on those things. Um, but I've always been mystified how this magical connection happens. Um, so to me, uh, the denotation of a SNEPS term, if you will, is a mental entity. Um, and if you say, well, how can you talk about truth and falsity if these things denote these rather than those? Um, well, that's not, not really the appropriate level to talk about. So some other agent or person might argue with uh, one of these agents that what they understand by a person named Stu is incomplete or missing in some sense, and then they could argue about it and try to clarify uh, this agent's notion of what that entity is. Um, but if uh, one doesn't get into an argument and someone says Stu to this agent, this agent will assume that that person is referring to the entity of this understanding agent, not some, not some other entity. That is, I understand you to be talking about things that I understand unless it becomes obvious to me that there's some mismatch in our communication and then we can have a discussion about it. Um, so it's really all about beliefs um, and the entities that are described by these beliefs. Okay. Um, so alignment um, is our approach to the symbol anchoring problem. On the afferent side, there's some object or phenomenon in the world um, that's sensed uh, at the SAL. It constructs some PML structures. Those are perceived, uh, and the results of perception is some entity, some mental entity, uh, that's represented in the knowledge layer by some SNPs terms. Uh, on the efferent side, um, there's a SNEPS term that denotes some action. Uh, it's implemented by a PMLA method, uh, which eventually results in some action in the world taking place. Um, okay, there are no questions so far. Um, this will be the running example. Um, this is the delivery agent and what, so I've been running the delivery agent using as a simulated agent and world um, a Java implementation of Carol the Robot. Maybe you've heard of or seen Carol the Robot. Um, and that implementation was done by, uh, I forget his name, at, at University of Waterloo. And uh, recently some of my colleagues have gotten interested in using this uh, Greenfoot uh, worlds and agents for also introductory computing and I thought well that would make a nice world and agent simulation for software uh, robots, software agents and so John has been using that um, for his, uh, his implementation of the delivery agent so he supplied me with all these figures um, so there's what it looks like uh, so the delivery agent's world, um, this is based on uh, the building that, my, that the computer science and engineering department used to be in until about a year or so ago. Um, so it's a floor of a building. There are four corridors, north, south, east, and, and west. There are 12 rooms numbered 1 through 15, although not all the numbers are represented. Um, some rooms have packages in them. Um, and there are three visually distinguishable building parts. That is, uh, the, uh, the agent might be looking at a piece of corridor, at a room, or at a wall. Um, this was also motivated by some of the coffee delivery agents at CMU and, and other people have worked on delivery robots. So the main task of the delivery agent is to deliver a package from one room to another. So that's what basically we can ask it to do. Um, but there are, of course, subtasks that it can also be asked to do. Um, and uh, unfortunately, this, well, fortunately or unfortunately, unfortunately, as far as I'm concerned, fortunately, as far as the complexity of this example, 
um, we're not interacting with this agent in English, uh, but sort of in a, in a formal language. But it's not too formal. OK, so that's the basic setup. Uh, so now some of the basic representation. Um, so I'm a, a basically a logic-oriented guy. So uh, representation issues will come across that way. So here are the individual constants. There are the directions, north, south, east, and west. Uh, room numbers, 1 through 15. Uh, and the building parts, room, corridor, and wall. So those are KL terms uh, denoting the agent's notion of these things. Uh, the language has functions and functional terms. So here are two functions. Uh, C of D is the corridor on the D side. So for example, C of north is this corridor. Um, and room of R, where R is a number, is the room numbered R. So this is room of 1, or room 1. Right? Um, and then a predicate, asterisk predicate. Um, so this one is on corridor. Um, so now this is, this is also a function, um, except this is a proposition valued function. So on corridor of R and C denotes, if you will, the proposition that room R faces on corridor C. For example, room 1 faces on C north. OK? Remember, every well-formed expression in SNPs is a term. Um, the benefit of that is we can have propositions about propositions without limit, without leaving first order logic. Because the propositions are terms, not sentences. And there's no problem about having a term as an argument of a function. Okay. Now, I said uh, two days ago that SNEPS was simultaneously a logic-based system, a frame, i.e. assertional frame-based system, and a propositional graph-based system. So here's two of those parts. Um, there also, we've, we've implemented three what we call modes in, in interacting with SNEPS. Um, so this is a picture of mode one, which is the default. So here's a logic-based view. Um, the proposition uh, that room one is on uh, the corridor C north. And this is, this is the SNEPS prompt, which is the way I'll be interacting with, with the agent for this talk. Um, and the period means assert what we say as assert this in the knowledge base, or the agent should believe this. Uh, and the output. Um, is uh, a reconstructed uh, formula, um, term really, um, with a, it's given a name. So this is WOOF3. In an even later version of SNEPS, it's WFT instead of WFF because it's a well-formed term, not really a well-formed formula, but anyway, still being old-fashioned a bit. And that bang at the end of the name indicates that this is something asserted in the knowledge base or believed by the agent, right? Because it's possible, it's very important in KR systems to be able to have propositions in the knowledge base that are not necessarily believed by the agent, right? So you can talk about it, for example, ask about it, say it's false, or believe that it's false. Um, so um, we can do that. And so the, uh, the exclamation mark at the end of the name is an indication to us that this is something that's believed. Um, if you want, think of that as a metalinguistic holds predicate. Okay? So it says this proposition is believed by the agent. Um, and, and so I, I typed that in, and then I said, show woof 3, and it drew this graph. Now. Sorry about that. I can't make the fonts much bigger. Um, but this, is, this node 
corresponds to the whole term. Room one is on corridor C north. Um, there's the term on corridor, and this arc is labeled R. So this is a graphical picture of a frame, of an assertional frame. The slots of a frame are the labels of the arcs, and the fillers of the slots are the nodes the arcs go to. And mode one just uses a default set of arcs, namely R, A1, A2, A3, A4, however many are needed. There's no limit to, to uh, binary relations. So the R points from uh, this node to Juan Carter. A1 points to this node, which, which has an R to room and an A1 to 1. And, uh, the, the, and A2 goes to this node, which has an R to uh, C and an A1 to north. Okay, so this node is a picture, a graphical drawing of the very same uh, assertion uh, that is shown here in a more symbolic logic format. Okay. Uh, one danger in KR is comparing two KR systems based on the pictures they draw. Because it's often the case that the pictures are very different, but if you actually dig into the implementation, it's the same. I, I've seen that again and again and again. So I, I emphasize that this is a picture, <laughs> a drawing for human consumption of what's represented. This is another creation, drawing, if you will, for human consumption of what's represented there. This is for people who like logic notation, and this is for people who like to look at graphs. But it's the same stuff underneath. Uh, the problem with mode one, mode one is the easiest to use. The problem with it is if one has quantified formulas with variables, uh, then they match lots of stuff because all the slots have the same names. So mode two, which exists, but my group and I, none of us much use it. Um, it was an intermediate form. Um, so here I said set mode two and then did the same thing. Um, and the only difference is the slots that are chosen. They're created uh, from the functional term, from the, from the function symbol. So this says on corridor, I, I, don't, I don't even remember. But all of these long labels have on corridor, well, these have on corridor as part of them. Um, this has, these two have room as, as part of them, and these two have C is part of them. Um, so again, the, the, the user, as it were, of the system doesn't have to worry about creating these slot names. The system does it, but still different um, terms that use different function symbols are teased apart as far as unification is concerned. Um, and finally, mode three, uh, which uh, unfortunately or, or fortunately um, is required for building agents. So that's the mode that we use for agents. Um, gives the user or agent architect full freedom on uh, deciding what the frame is to use for different function symbols. So I set mode to three. And this defines a frame. So a frame is a, a representation. It's actually closest to the internal representation of a functional term, whether it's a proposition valued functional term or, or not a functional term that denotes some other kind of entity. And so one says define frame gives it the function symbol and then the names of the slots um, if nil is in the first slot, then that means that the functional term, the function symbol is not stored in the frame and, and doesn't appear. In the graph, uh, I'll explain why that's possible or useful uh, in a moment. And so the system says, okay, C of X1 will be represented by this uh, uh, structure uh, which is a set of 
uh, pairs, uh, slot name and fillers, corridor on X1. And define the frame room. Again, we won't store room, just the room is the slot. It says room X1 will be represented by the room X1, corridor, uh, and on corridor as the two arguments room and corridor. So on corridor X1, X2 will be represented by room to X1, corridor to X2. So um, then I make this assertion and ask it to show the uh, show a graph of it, and this is what's drawn. Notice it's simpler. Um, so this technique of not storing the the function symbol um, in the frame is possible when the slots together uniquely specify what the function symbol is. So in that case, we don't have to store the function symbol. I'll show you examples where the function symbol is stored. Uh, okay, so this is what the graph looks like. So on Carter, room one, C north, um, is this node with a, a room arc to this node, which has a the room arc to one, and a um, Carter arc, right, a, um, a Carter arc to this node, which has a Carter on arc to north. Okay, and that's the last graphs I'll show you <laughs> today. Okay, I'll, I'll stick to this notation. Um, if you want to see the formal connection between um, the logic notation, the frame notation, and the graph notation, uh, see a paper that Dan Schlegel and I had in the GKR from two years ago. It's uh, lecture notes in artificial intelligence, some number or other. Um, you can find a, a reference in our website. Okay, so this is the mode we'll be using today to define the delivery agent. So let's tell it some stuff. Um, there are corridors, um, and we'll call the north and south corridor the main corridors. That's where the rooms are, and the other two the side corridors. So um, define the frame corridor, and here, so we tend to use a frame with two slots, class and member, to represent the instance relation. So, um, but this is a notation people are used to. Um, so uh, we can say that um, C north is a corridor by saying corridor of C north, and that will build a frame whose class slot is filled by Carter and whose member slot is filled by C north. Uh, and um, then there are main car there's main Carter, again, class member, because we'll store main Carter. So class member is used for the instance relation for any category, and the category itself is stored in the class slot and the instance in the member slot. Uh, and side corridor is a function symbol saying that um, something is a side corridor. So main and side corridors. For all C, uh, if C is a main corridor or a side corridor, then it's a corridor. Now, this is an instance of, I showed you the other day, but I'll go through it again, uh, an or entailment. It takes a set of antecedents. Order and multiplicity doesn't matter. It's just a set of antecedents. Um, and a set or a singleton of consequence. Um, and the semantics is that um, if the agent believes any one of these things, any one of these propositions, then it's justified in concluding the consequent. Um, and it's quantified over, over corridors. So note that um, including an argument position in curly brackets puts multiple fillers in that slot of the frame. So here's another use of it. Main corridor takes one argument, and here I'm giving it a set, C north and C south. So this asserts that C north and C south are both main corridors. Right? C north and C south are both fillers of the um, 
uh, member slot, where the class slot is filled by main corridor. Um, this is entered to the SNEPS prompt. The exclamation mark says, put it in the knowledge base and do forward inference. Or in agents speak, believe this and think about it. <laughs> Draw some conclusions. So it responds, um, and unfortunately these always come out backwards. So it's, it's easiest. One of these days, which will probably never actually occur, I'll change the code and get it to print the way I like to read it, but for now. Um, so this says C South and C North are main corridors. Um, notice you can subtly realize that this is not an echo of what I entered, but this is a regeneration of the logical expression from the representation. And because the, uh, the two elements of the set happen to come out in a different order, but it's a set, so who cares? Right? Um, so this says C South and C North are main corridors. And then it concludes from that that C North is a main corridor and C South is a main corridor and that C North and C South are corridors. Right. Yeah? Why does the top sentence not have an exclamation mark? Why does the what? The top expression, the all... This one? Yeah. Um, there was nothing it could do about this anyway because it didn't know any corridors, so I just asserted it and uh -huh. I didn't say do forward inference with that. Oh, uh, okay. So just store that as believed. Mm -hmm. Um, and then store this as belief, but do forward inference on it. Okay. Any other questions? Um, so also C East and C West are side corridors, and okay, so it does that too and concludes that they're both corridors. Um, rooms, of course, are rooms. So the frame room is again going to be a, a, an instance of a category frame, so it uses the same slots. Um, and room one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, eleven, thirteen, fifteen, and our rooms. Okay. And um, the agent could figure this out, but I'm telling it. Right, but I couldn't make the agent walk around the corridor and learn which rooms are on which corridors. I suppose I should do that and stop saying I could do it and just do it. Uh, but meanwhile, I haven't. So here it is. Uh, rooms one, two, three, four, five, and seven are on C North. One, two, one, two, three, four, five, seven are on C North. Um, uh, six, eight. Uh, 9, 11, 13, and 15 are on C South, and uh, 1 and 15 are also on C West, and 7 and 9 are also on C East. Right, the corner rooms are on two corridors. Now, let's talk about time. Um, so, agents, as has been said this week, should have a model of time. That is, they should know when things occurred. Uh, and we have built agents that do that, that have models of time. I showed you that FIVAR that talked, you know, I talked to Stu and I'm now talking to you. Um, it's a little more complicated and it would make this tutorial a lot more complicated to explain our representation of times and what goes on. And it would obviate another interesting discussion that I want that I do want to have this morning. So with a model of time, beliefs may have temporal arguments, or they may be, a beliefs may be the one argument and an assertion that, that this occurred or was true at this time, but they could be associated with times. Beliefs of previous states remain associated with their times, right? Now is not, in our view, there's no term in the knowledge representation denoting now, because now, of course, moves. Rather, there are terms denoting times, and the deictic registers include a register whose value is the time or semi-lattice of times um, that currently denote now, and then it gets replaced as now moves. That's a whole interesting discussion that I don't have time for. Haha. <laughs> Um, okay. 
Um, and so as I just said, we have to allow for a moving now. Um, and this supports episodic memory, right? Because events, beliefs, actions that occurred get associated with their times. They stay associated with their times. There's a moving now point, um, and, uh, and the, the time that's the current value of the now register is related to the times of other things that just happened. And so as time moves, beliefs get hooked up to this growing timeline, and that forms the skeleton of the episodic memory. Um, and there's no reason other than running out of memory or being an accurate uh, human model to, to forget any of this stuff because if something was true on, on, on August 1st, uh, 2013, then any time in the future it still was true on August 1st, 2013. Okay. Without a model of time, <coughs> we get an agent, as like the ones that have been mentioned occasionally this week, where all beliefs are about now. They're just, what is the current situation? Uh, and of course, I mean, you could say, you could still tell it something that was true some other time, but it won't be related to now, right? Um, so you could give it past beliefs or whatever, but essentially, um, there's no episodic memory because there's no moving now point. Um, beliefs about previous states can be forgotten if all, you're re uh, if all you're believing is what's currently true. You don't, right, these sorts of agents without a model of time are, you know, uh, have no memory for what used to be the case. They just believe what's now. Strange as cognitive agents, but anyway. Um, so this requires some kind of belief revision or truth maintenance system. Um, as the world changes and as the agent's beliefs about what currently hold <laughs> changes, then there has to be some way of getting rid of beliefs that are no longer accurate because the world has changed. Um, and since I'd rather talk about that than about our model of time, um, I've chosen to talk about the delivery agent, which is, which is one of these guys, uh, without a model of time. But if I were talking about this, then I couldn't talk about that because I can't justify it as, as well. So, um, yeah, so the delivery agent has no model of time. So it's, that's just one of the ways in which it's defective, but as I said, it lets me talk about some other, some issues that I'd like to talk about. Okay, comments, questions? Yeah. Um, shouldn't the uh, agent with a model of time also need a belief revision for its semantic memory? Yes, for semantic memory and for, for multiple sources. And so there, yeah, there is a host of, of reasons that it still needs belief revision. Uh, but this is so easy to demonstrate and, and explain. And it's, it's one of the basic reasons for having a belief revision slash truth maintenance system. Um, so it, it justifies it well. But yeah, it's still, we still need it in the other. Yeah, Pei. Yeah, uh, I think a tricky point is how to separate uh, revision and update. You see, I get some information, uh, describe a situation. Then I get a piece of another information which conflict with the previous one. Uh, in some situations, it's the world that changed. Uh, in some other situations, it's the kind of like the previous uh, information is wrong, so that we need to use the other one. Exactly. Yeah, how to separate the two or you will want to, or you need to separate them. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you about that, okay. at least to some extent. But you're absolutely right. There's, there's a, 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 a bunch of reasons that one needs this kind of facility for different reasons, only one of which is that the world changes and you want to keep up with it. Okay, any other? Okay. Well, so we're dealing with agents in a changing world uh, with beliefs that are only about now. And so, as you all know, of course, at least those of you who have some KR, general AI background, uh, is we're talking about what McCarthy named fluence, right? So propositional fluence are, are proposition value terms uh, that change 
uh, in different times or situations, but I'm using time, not situation. Um, and one of these is a uh, head is, which is the proposition that the, which denotes the proposition that building part X is immediately in front of the agent. So right now, a head is Carter, right? But if it turned to the left, then the head is, uh, then it would be room that's ahead, and if it turned around, it would be wall that's ahead. So whenever the agent moves, the, um, the ahead is assertion uh, might change. Uh, so we define this frame, ahead is. We don't need that to, to hold on to the proposition symbol because we'll just use the slot ahead um, and store the, in that uh, the, the term that denotes the building part that's immediately ahead of it. And then we tell it exactly one of these things is true. So XOR is a connective that takes a set of arguments. Um, and unlike the classical definition of exclusive OR, which is a strictly a binary connective, uh, it takes a set of arguments and it says what we really want it to say, which is exactly one of these things can be true at any time or should be believed at any time. So for a discussion of, of those issues, see my KR paper in, from two years ago or whatever it was. Um, so. Um, exactly one of these things is true. Um, and in fact, ahead is Carter currently. That's an, the initial condition. Um, think about that. And it says, oh, ahead is Carter. And it's not the case that ahead is wall. And it's not the case that ahead is room. OK. OK, so now I've shown you some connectives. So um, let me show you this list again, which you've seen before. So for any proposition P, that's how we write not P. Um, a conjunction, which it takes a set of arguments. Um, we can write it in this way, or we can write it in this infix way. Or, which takes a set of arguments and is this, the usual disjunction. Again, we can write it in this way or that way. NAND, which just like XOR is not really the classical NAND, which is a strictly binary connective, but it's what we all really think NAND should mean, which is that it's not the case that all of these are true. Um, NOR, which I just talked about, which means, oh, I didn't just talk about that, right? Which is not the classical NOR, which is strictly binary, but the NOR that takes a set of arguments and says, none of these are true, right? Believe, right? This is the belief that none of them are believed. Um, XOR, which I talked about before, uh, IFF, which is that these are all should be believed or, ne or they all should have their negations believed, right? They all have the same, quote, truth value. Again, this is not the classical biconditional, which is, strictly speaking, a binary connective. The, the problem with these is that and and or are associative, commutative, and idempotent, which is why you can think of their arguments as forming a set. And that's not the case with NAND, nor uh, XOR, and if and only if. Work it out if you don't believe me. Um, I've, I've said this to some really experienced logicians who are quite surprised, actually, uh, by that fact. Uh, and here's an infix version of if and only if, which is kind of nasty because it makes you think that these are the standard biconditionals, and, and it's not really. They're, they all form one set of arguments. Um, but one of my students implemented that, so OK. OK, questions or comments? Um, these are actually all special cases of either one of these two. <laughs> so these two connectives are um, expressionally complete. Um, uh, so this, uh, they both take uh, parameters um, and or the semantics is at least i and at most j of these propositions are true, true, in quotes. Remember what I really mean by are true, right? The agent believes them. <laughs> okay. um, and uh, so all the ones that I showed before are really syntactic abbreviations of variations of andor. Uh, as is thresh, it's, thresh is actually the negation of an andor, the andor zero zero of andor ij. 
um, and says either fewer than uh, i or more than j of these pn uh, are true in that same sense. Um, so these, these are the inner interval and these are the outer interval. So either one of these is, is expressionless, ex complete <laughs> in that sense. Um, uh, But you won't see those again in this, in this, this morning. Well, one thing about those is that they are all symmetric uh, in regard to their arguments, and so that doesn't, hold, that doesn't work for, um, as easily for implication. Uh, so uh, these two are syntactic variations of what we call an or entailment. If any one of these uh, is true or holds, then all of these are. This is the and entailment. If all of these are believed, then you're justified in concluding any one of these. And this is a generalization. These are, are actually abbreviations of some versions of this, which is an I entailment that um, if the agent believes at least I of these N propositions, it's justified in concluding any or all of the Qs. So the or entailment I is one, and the and entailment I is N. And then there are those other weird cases that have occasionally been found useful. OK? Yeah? What's the distinction between the first two again? Uh, syntax. That's all. Uh, they're just syntactic variants. Oh, they mean the same thing? They mean exactly the same thing, yeah. Except in the next version of SNEPS, this is going to be a syntactic variation of the and entailment, because we somehow found that more convenient. But forget I just said that. For right now, um, this is an or entailment. <laughs> okay, that's something for me to worry about and be confused with when I'm using both versions. Okay, yeah. I'm not sure if this is the right number to ask, but how does it deal with uncertainty? Oh, good question. Uh, it doesn't. Okay. Uh, uncertainty is something that needs to be considered. Uh, and sorry, I don't. I'm a binary kind of guy, I guess. Um, and whenever someone says you should add uncertainties or probabilities into, into SNEPs, my, act, my response is, great, you want to do it? Fine with me, let's, let's, let's do it, but not me. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, here, I, it seems that you have two toys and you pick one out of whether, whether you do it this way. Uh, this or and an I can either be put uh, in combined into the implication or maybe uh, combine with the consequence. You just use one implication and you just say that the, the consequence. Very good. Uh, Boy, are you observant. Um, um, and there is, is similar problem, <laughs> so. there is a difference. Uh -huh. um, so if you, uh, let's take this one. Um, so instead of doing this, you could use the or on the left, and then just say, if the disjunction of these are true, then, then any of those are true. Um, so two, two issues. One is that would require the system to derive the or in order to um, discharge the implication. Whereas this, it can backchain. In fact, this is implemented in a, uh, a uh, multitasking, multi-processing kind of way, and my student Dan Schlegel, who I've mentioned, is currently implementing a version of, of SNEPs in Clojure, which will really take advantage of concurrency. Um, and so, um, if you did it with the or, the disjunction implies the consequent, um, then you would first have to derive the disjunction and then consequent. Here, this goes into a simple switch. Um, it can start in parallel trying to derive any of those, and then in an e eager beaver fashion, the first one that comes back and says, oh, I'm believed, uh, we can kill the rest and, and draw the conclusion. And then the other reason is, who was I talking about Lance Rips with? Um, he says people don't have or introduction in their repertoire, because it's a stupid rule. Right? If, if you know A, why bother concluding A or B? Right? Um, if, if you look at a logic text, you will find, I'm sure, the only use of or entailment is, a, is to then immediately discharge an implication. 
And so it's, it, it's just a syntactic abbreviation of P1 implies the Qs, P2 implies the Qs, P3 implies the Qs. You get any of the Ps and conclude the Qs. Okay, other questions? Okay, um, so you got to have a, uh, quantifiers. So there's nothing too noteworthy to say about this. This is just a typical universal quantifier. And then there's one, um, what I call numerical quantifier, um, with uh, one basic form and two abbreviations. So this says there are k instances of x1 through xn that satisfy all of p1 through pn, and at least i and at most j of them also satisfy the q's. Ah, that's a mouthful. Okay, two more useful uh, abbreviations of that. If, if you just specify the j, it means at most j of these things that satisfy the p's satisfy the q's. Right? You have at most one genetic mother. Last time I said biological, even that's not true anymore. You have at most one genetic mother. I think that's still true. Um, and this says you have at least I of the K ones of these that satisfy the P's. Um, there's at least I of them that also satisfy the Q's. And uh, unfortunately, the only implementation we've done of this requires you to specify k for this because it really works on the others, right? As soon as you find i of them, they're at least i, so as soon as you find k minus i or k minus i plus one, whatever, that don't, then you can conclude the other i do. Um, and I'd like to not have to say k and let you know, let the whole inference be defeasible in case you learn about more of them and it wasn't quite right, but for now you have to specify the, the K. Um, and actually we don't have implemented in SNEPs the simple existential um, for reasons that are probably too arcane to discuss, but as, as we all know, you can replace uh, existential with a skullum function of the universal, so who cares? We care, but don't. <laughs> okay? Um, uh, anyway. Okay. Um, so now, here comes my chance to talk about belief revision. Side excursion, right? I'm going to introduce our approach to belief revision with a different example. So push the delivery agent. Here's another uh, example. Um, and this is an example I use in, I've used in my KR classes. So we'll set mode one so things are simple. Um, I'll tell you what that means. So this is the four-story building example. There's a four-story building. The first two floors are underground. The second two floors are above ground. Okay. So this says you're either on floor one, two, three, or four. Floor one and two are below ground, right? If you're on floor one or floor two, then you're below ground. If you're on three or four, you're above ground. Okay. Um, this expert mode, I'm now promoting you all to experts, um, are a way to see what's some of what's going on under the covers. Normally, under the covers, I'll explain as we see them. Okay, you understand the example? Okay, so we'll start off saying the agent's on floor one. So we'll assert on floor one, think about it, uh, on floor one, location below ground, not on floors two, three, or four. What you see here um, is a support structure that consists of, there can be more than one for a proposition. Um, each support in, in the set of supports um, has a, what we call an origin tag, which says where the proposition came from, um, and what we call an origin set, which I'll explain in a second. So this on floor one is a hypothesis. It was told to the system from the outside. It wasn't derived in any sense. It has 
does, it knows no justification. What I'm show, about to show you is a, a, is a version of AT, an ATMS. Although we implemented it before Declare did, but he gave it its name. Um, these are all derived. That's what the DER means. Okay. And this was derived from hypotheses WOOF1 and WOOF7. WOOF1 is on floor one. WOOF7, which I'll show you in the next slide, was that assertion that you're on exactly one of these floors. So given that you're, oh, I'm sorry, WOOF7 was one and two are below ground. Right. Uh, and these not floors are derived from WOOF1, that you're on floor one, and WOOF5, which is you can only be on one of these floors at a time. So this origin set is, is like the set of assumptions. Those are the hypotheses that were actually used to derive these propositions in the natural deduction system. So every rule of the reasoning system, the natural deduction reasoning system, has associated with it a way to compute the origin set of the child from the origin set of the parents of that, inf of that rule of inference. So, I don't know if you can read this. Um, list asserted woofs lists all the current beliefs in the knowledge base. It says on floor one is a hypothesis, its origin set is itself. Uh, you're in exactly floor uh, four, three, two, or one. There's also a hypothesis with five. Um, uh, let's skip to seven. With seven is that one and two are below ground. With nine is that four and three, three and four are above ground. Location below ground depends on with one, on floor one, and with seven, floor one and two are below ground. Uh, one and three and four are above ground, that's with nine, which is a hypothesis, uh, and not on floors two, three, or four, depend on with one, um, that you're on floor one, and with five, that, you can, that you're always on exactly one of the floors. Okay, so no matter how deep the derivation is, the origin set is the set of hypotheses that were actually used to derive that proposition, at least in that way. This is a version of the logic of relevant entailment R, uh, which you can read about in the two-volume entailment um, set. Uh, questions? Just yeah. To make sure I understand correctly, you have to, be, uh, you have to give the expert command in order to get the output in this format? Yes. Otherwise, if you don't say you're an expert, then you don't, you don't get those printed. It's probably more confusing for those people. <laughs> okay? Other questions? Okay, let's move to floor four. So I now say on floor four, think about it. And it says a contradiction was detected uh, within the context. I won't explain. A context is essentially a set of hypotheses. Uh, the default, default context. Um, the contradiction involves the proposition you want to assert that you're on floor four, which is a hypothesis, and the previously existing proposition not on floor four, uh, which was derived from WOOF 1 and 5. Okay. It's easy for the system to recognize a contradiction <coughs> because no sub-expression is, is represented in the in memory more than once. So whenever a sub-expression is a sub-expression of multiple expressions, they each actually have the same thing frame in a slot. Uh, and so not on floor four is a frame with negation as the function symbol. Remember even connectives are proposition valued functions of propositions not truth values, um, and the slot filler is woof 4. So we're asserting the negation of something that is asserted, so that's a contradiction. So at base, it recognizes contradictions only when they become explicit. Right? You can have 
a contradictory knowledge base that is one in which a contradiction follows and it, the system won't say anything. That's okay, it's a paraconsistent logic. It's not the case that anything whatsoever follows from a contradiction. Um, but if, it, if you get it to think about things and a contradiction becomes explicit, then it worries about it, right? And this way of dealing it, with it, which we call manual or assisted belief revision, it comes to the, quote, user and says, here's the contradiction, what do you want to do about it? But it is assisted. Um, so, well, we say you have the following options to attempt to resolve the contradiction automatically, let me take care of it. To continue anyway, knowing a contradiction is derivable, which you can do, you can reason in a contradictory concept, context because it's not disastrous, it's not the case that anything whatsoever can follow from it. Um, to revise the inconsistent part of the context manually, which is what we'll choose, or to discard this new assertion from the context. Oops, I made a mistake, forget it. And I type R, that is, I want to revise the inconsistent part of the context manually. So here's what happens next. It says, in order to make the context consistent, you must delete at least one hypothesis from this set below. With five, that is, you're on exactly one of these floors at a time. And by the way, there are four, this supports four propositions. The proposition on floor four, uh, which was a hypothesis and um, supports one proposition, namely itself. And with one, the proposition that you're on floor one. Now, where does this come from, that, that list of three propositions? Well, um, the contradiction was on floor four and not on floor four. If you union those two origin sets, you get the set of hypotheses from which this contradiction was derived. Guaranteed. The logic guarantees that those were really used to derive each one of these. So it is guaranteed that if you eliminate at least one of these three, the contradiction will go away, at least in that way that it was derived. It may come up some other way. So the system can tell you what you have to do is delete at least one of these hypotheses. Okay, so a little more technical terminology. Notice what you just told it on floor four is in this list. So this is what the AGM belief revision community refers to as non-prioritized belief revision. What I just told you that resulted in a contradiction is just as liable to be wrong, to be something you want to get rid of, as anything else that caused this contradiction. Okay, so non-prioritized in the sense of what I just told you has no priority over anything else you previously believed. So this is an approach to the problem that Pei said, uh, where you get new information and, and it's just a matter of one informant disagreeing with another informant, or you used to believe this and now you believe that, but the world hasn't changed. Um, so, uh, so then there are these possibilities to discard some hypothesis from the list, to see all the hypotheses in the full context, this as well as the ones that weren't involved in the contradiction. Uh, to see what you've already removed, to quit revising this set or for instructions again. And so I say D, I want to delete, uh, uh, discard some hypotheses. Then it asks me which one, and I say three, namely floor four, floor one, on floor one, because we were moving from floor one to floor four, so floor one is the thing I don't want it to believe anymore. Um, so then it says, okay, um, we get out of that. And now if I list the cert woofs, uh, we're on floor four, hypothesis. We're on exactly one of these floors. One and two are below ground. Three and four are above ground. Our location is above ground. We're not on three, we're not on two, we're not on one. Um, it's funny, there should be something else. But anyway. Um, and that's it. Notice that location below ground has disappeared. It's no longer believed. Okay, it wasn't involved in the contradiction, but it used on floor one to derive it, and on floor one has gone away, so it's no longer there. 
Okay. So, summary. Uh, we distinguish hypotheses from derived beliefs. Uh, retains, the system retains the origin sets, the set of hypotheses actually used to derive the belief, uh, which is a style of ATMS, assumption-based truth maintenance system. Uh, the system recognizes explicit contradictions easily. It knows the possible culprits because they've been computed as the origin sets when the rules fire, when the, the system is reasoning. Uh, it allows the user to choose the actual culprit. Right? Maybe we were wrong. You can be on more than one floor at the same time. <laughs> right? Maybe that was the problem. Um, this is what we call manual or assisted belief revision. Uh, what we call the current context is a set of hypotheses currently believed. Uh, and the current belief set is the beliefs with the current context as a subset of its origin set. That is, any belief that has been derived whose origin set is a subset of the current context is something that's believed. Right? It's been derived from current hypothesis beliefs. But we don't want an autonomous agent to every once in a while stop and say to some nearby human, hey, there's a contradiction. What should I believe? <laughs> Right? So we, we really want all this to happen automatically without bothering us. But this is still what's going to go on under the covers. Uh, so I'll come back to that. Uh, so it is 10.16. Um, there, there's a three-hour slot. If we had a break, right? if we had a half-hour break, which is probably too much, Right, that would say an hour and 15 minutes, a half hour break, and an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, so do you want to take a break? I, I, it's up to you. How many would like to take a break now? Well, that's enough. Let's take a short break. So be back in, let me say, five minutes. OK? <laughs> A control structure which is left to right because otherwise the end then wouldn't, wouldn't work correctly. Um, it's also the case, I, I don't have the example here to show you, but if you make, for example, C of X uh, uh, a literal in the body of multiple rules, all of which get called to solve some problem, it will be executed multiple times. Um, and when reasoning, that's kind of silly. Because if you ask, is D true on, on uh, E, and you figure out that C is true on E for one of these rules, it doesn't make any sense to derive C on E for another rule. But it, if your interpretation is do C on E, perform it, it does make sense to perform it more than once. Right? You hit the Enter key at the end of a line. You get to the end of another line. And no one says, I don't have to hit the enter key because I already did that. So Prolog, uh, at least the standard implementation, the standard compiler for Prolog, um, does a full depth first search, left right depth first search of the search tree. And if the same sub goal appears multiple times, it'll solve it multiple times. So SNEPS was built, as I said earlier, to not do that. So if some sub-goal, uh, some goal is a sub-goal of a problem in multiple times, it will work on it only once, even if it hasn't completed it the first time. When others join in, they say, well, I'm already, it says, I'm already working on that. I'll let you know when I solve it. And it doesn't do it multiple times. Um, and it's also implemented in this multiprocessing system. So if the order doesn't matter, it, the order doesn't matter. And it may happen in, in some other order. And that's the reason that just attaching, making procedural attachments on some uh, predicate terms like A, B, or C um, is not going to work because it was designed fundamentally as a reasoning system, not as this pun between a reasoning system and an, and an acting system. So fortunately, what that means um, is acts 
really need their own syntax and their own semantics. We can't just pretend logical expressions are rules for acting. They're different sorts of things. Um, and, and different things matter to them. So we need our own syntax and semantics for an acting subsystem, which is what we did. So um, as I said the other day, we can take all acts representable in SNPs and divide them into subcategories in two different ways. The first way is to talk about external acts, which are acts that actually affect the environment, that operate on the environment. Um, and these are, must be supplied by the agent architect, the agent designer, or the hardware robot that you, you, uh, that you choose to use, well, motivated by the, the actual hardware. Then there are mental acts. Mental acts are acts, but they affect the knowledge layer. And there are actually four of these that are already built in. Uh, the first two are easy, believe and disbelieve. So believe takes a proposition as an argument and says, believe it. Right? When you perform the belief of a proposition, the result is to believe it. The result of, of performing disbelief on a proposition is to no longer believe it, or to, even if you didn't, whether you did or not before, no longer to believe it, not necessarily to believe its negation. Right? It's a different issue to be skeptical, right? to be agnostic about a proposition, whether you believe it or not, uh, and believe its negation. Right? So SNEPS is actually, well, R is a four-valued logic anyway. Right? True, false, both, and neither. So the truth value could be neither. It's both when it's a contradiction. The other two mental acts are adopt and unadopt, which are applicable to policies as opposed to propositions. So those are the only mental acts. Then there are control acts. So a control act is an act that specifies a certain order or a certain way of doing its argument acts. So if you're a computer scientist, I guess you all are more or less, uh, then you recognize this. So there's a way of doing a sequence, a, a way of doing selection, a way of doing loop. Therefore, this acting language is Turing complete, right? We can, given, given the um, basic repertoire of behaviors, we can write any complex behavior based on those since we have these three. This, yeah? I wonder how many other things are in that uh, etc. You know, besides this major three, uh, sequence selection and loop, uh, what else do you have? Oh, I'll show you. Okay, okay. hang on a second. Uh, as soon as I get back to that. Um, what's going on? I'm backed up too far. OK. So, um, so obviously, um, influenced by strips, uh, there are these four propositions that are built in, as it were. Um, and I'll show you the way in which they're built in. Uh, propositions about acts. So precondition takes an act and a proposition, and it says um, before doing this act, you should make sure that this proposition holds, that you believe it holds anyway. Okay. Uh, so unfortunately, of course, uh, that has to be a proposition that the agent itself can bring about. <laughs> right? So precondition in that sense. Uh, act plan says um, the way to do act alpha 1 is to do act alpha 2. So presumably alpha 2 is closer to primitive acts. I didn't show you. I didn't show you this, did I? No. Not this time. So primitive acts, I'm sorry, the second uh, categorization of acts is primitive acts are implemented as part of SNEPs or implemented at the PMLA by the agent architect. Composite acts are structured by control acts. So a control act is an act. A control act takes acts as arguments, and it itself is an act, and it's a composite act. And defined acts 
are acts defined by these act plan assertions. Okay. So um, propositions about acts, precondition, act plan, the way to do act alpha one is to do act alpha two. Goal plan, um, if you want to bring about uh, proposition phi, uh, a way to do that, I'm sorry, did I say the before? Act plan alpha one, alpha two means a way to do alpha one is to do alpha two, not the way to do alpha one is alpha two. And goal plan says a way to bring about phi is to do alpha. Okay, so when I was designing this language, I worried about should we use goal talk or act talk? And I, uh, you know, some people like goal talk, some people like act talk. They're, they're, you can get rid of one and do entirely the other, but since this is supposed to be a, a natural language interacting agent, right, use them both. Let people use whatever's most convenient. And effect, again, uh, inherited from strips, is that the effect of performing alpha is that phi holds, or an effect of performing alpha is that phi holds. I'll have more to say about effect later. Okay, so these are the propositions about acts. Now, uh, it's interesting to note that policies are one way in which reasoning interacts with acting. Okay. So, um, in forward reasoning, and SNAP supports, supports both forward and backward reasoning as well as a couple of others, <coughs> um, if the agent has adopted the policy when phi do alpha, and phi, it, it starts to believe phi and is thinking about it, then it will do alpha uh, and then on a, immediately unadopt the when do. So it's a one time, as I said, it's the appropriate thing to do put, when you push the walk, walk button, adopt a policy that when you see the walk light, cross the street one time. You could do it again on another street. Whenever do says, whenever you come to believe phi, uh, do alpha, and retain that policy. And then there's one backward reasoning policy, which, which I call here if do, and that is um, if you want to know whether phi holds, perform alpha. So alpha is presumably a sensory act. And so this is the closest we come to, to the kind of procedural attachment in, uh, in prologue. Right? If you want to know whether phi holds, instead of doing inference, perform alpha. And the result of that should be, is presumably a, a belief about phi. Okay, so these connect reasoning to acting. And then there's another set of control acts that connect acting and reasoning. Um, and the first two were motivated by Dijkstra's guarded if and guarded loop. So, since it's SNFs, we tend to put SN in front of almost anything we can think of. So SNF um, takes a set of arguments, um, these if arguments, these if terms, and then optionally an else term. And so the semantics is um, if any of these fees hold that is are believed by the agent, then it performs the SNF by performing one of those by performing the corresponding alpha, but chosen non-deterministically uh, from those sets in which uh, the fees are true. But if none of the fees are true and the else default act is there, then do that instead. Um, and that's just Dijkstra's guarded if. And then the snitterate is Dijkstra's guarded loop. Um, this is exactly like the sniff except if at least one of these fees turns out to be true and then its corresponding alpha is performed, uh, do the whole thing again. So keep doing this if until finally none of the fees hold and then if the um, default is there, do that, but if it's not, just go on, you, you've done it. Uh, and then, then two uh, um, that sort of iterate on objects 
and, uh, right? So this is with some x that satisfies phi of x, non-deterministically chosen if there's more than one, uh, then perform alpha on that. But if there is no such x and the default is there, do that instead. And with all says, if there's one or more entities that satisfy x, entities x that satisfy phi of x, do them all in some non-deterministic order. Um, but if none of them do, I'm sorry, do A on all of them in some non-deterministic order. But if there are no such x's, then, and delta is there, do that. Yeah? You keep saying the non-deterministic order, but wouldn't you want to do some kind of prioritized order according to the system's goals? or? Well, then you have al alternative constructs. You okay. do this when you don't care. Okay. Right? Like, I want you to do f a few things. I don't yeah. care what the order. You know, you could choose them or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. Okay. Um, and so let me point out that this is also a connection between acting and reasoning because all of these count as acts, right? Syntactically and semantically, they're, I mean, semantically they're acts. You can perform a sniff, you can perform a snittery, right? But in order to perform any one of those, you have to do some reasoning. Uh, yes, uh, I'll try. <laughs> um, so whenever I said, um, if one or more of these fees holds or is believed, um, with some or all entities x that satisfy p of x, in all those cases, that triggers backward inference. Right? So it's not determined by what's believed explicitly currently but what, whether those beliefs can be derived. And so doing a with sum can trigger some arbitrary amount of reasoning to think about and decide which entities satisfy phi. Is there a way to restrict the amount of reasoning that happens at that point? Uh, that would be nice. I, I've had one student work on some resource-bounded reasoning, which is a good idea, but somehow Somehow it didn't work out that we said, oh, that's so wonderful, we'll adopt it. But, but it was some kind of measure of, of chaining or, or inference firing, and, right? So, but remember that the system is multi-processed um, in this um, eager beaver way. Um, and so once, once you get an answer, you can forget about the things that took more time. Everyone, should I explain what I mean by eager beaver evaluation? Let, okay, so let me do it quickly, right? So you all know that a dumb way to evaluate uh, 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 an AND in a programming language like Fortran, right, is to evaluate all the operands and then do an AND of them, right? And everyone knows that's stupid, right? So the, the popular way now is to evaluate them one at a time if it's an AND until something turns out to be false and then you can stop, right? The problem with that is the order in which you try the arguments is specified in the source code, right? So what we do is what I call, I don't think I'm the first one to call this kind of thing eager beaver evaluation, start them all in parallel. And as soon as one of them returns false, then cancel the others and, and return. <laughs> okay, yeah. But if the evaluation have some byproduct, that will introduce uncertainty. Right? We don't know which one actually. Uh, yeah, right. That's right. That's that's the other side of the face of non-determinism and all of this stuff. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, right. So we can. Right. So just like the when do, whenever do, and if do has reasoning leading to acting, this has the attempt to, these have the attempt to perform an act leads to some amount of reasoning. Okay, and, and I should come back to that. Uh, I, I should mention that again. So these are just standard control acts. Um, so uh, achieve 
the proposition P is the act of, oh, this does trigger some reasoning, the act of deriving goal plans for phi, right? It, reasoning to derive plans that are said to be poss possibly bring about phi and not deterministically do one of them. Uh, do all does all of these, but in a non-deterministic order. Do one does one of these, but in a non-deterministic order. And SN sequence does the first and then the second in order. Okay, so we have the sniff, we have snitterate, and we have SN sequence, so there it is. Yeah? Is there a way to say this will have to be done at the same time? Like, for example, we'll control two hands will hold up. Yeah, the, the bowl of soup problem. Uh, no. That would be a good thing to, to get in there. Um, right. that's, that's the example that defeats all of us old folks who used to say a parallel computer can't do anything that a serial computer can't do because you can just simulate the parallelism. But you'll spill the soup. Is you all <laughs> run in parallel? Uh... I think the current implementation does the, the latter, uh, but yeah, that, that would be a good idea. I think it would be a good idea. Then it becomes impossible to debug these things, as everyone knows, but that's what happens with parallelism. Okay, so um, the real payoff of all of this and, and my saying that there are these four propositions about, uh, uh, about acts um, is telling you what the acting executive is currently. And uh, let me see if I can go through this semi quickly. Well, but you can ask questions. So uh, perform the act, act. How is that done? So there's a queue, an acting queue. And so it takes the first act off the queue and performs it. Uh, BDI, if you intend to do something, it's on the acting queue. You will get to it eventually, maybe. Um, so let pre be the set of propositions P such that it's derivable that P is a precondition for act. Notice it uses reasoning to figure that out. Set non yet to be the set of pre other than those P's for which it's derivable that they currently hold. If not yet is not empty, I didn't know how to find the right symbols in Keynote. Uh, is not empty, then perform the following SN sequence. Uh, those of you who know VDL is kind of looks like that, right? Um, if you don't, don't worry about it. Uh, perform this sequence. Do all of the acts such that the acts A, such that A is achieve P, where P is one of these not yet achieved preconditions. And then try act again, because in accomplishing some of the preconditions, you may have done away with, right? You may have undone some of the others. Um, and here's another thing we haven't done yet. Uh, even though one student was really worried about this for a while but never did get it done. And, um, nowhere in here is there possibility of failure. So that's, that's a problem. Um, there's got to be a way for the agent to just give up at some point. Um, okay, so um, if there are un, unaccomplished uh, preconditions, uh, achieve them. Uh, if there are... Uh, when you're done with that, let effects be the set of propositions P such that it's derivable that P is an effect of the act. And it's important that that be derived before you do the act. Uh, although I found one case where you need to figure out the effect after it's done it. So that's another hole that we really should plug sometime. Um, then, if the act is primitive, uh, then just apply the, co the connected, the attached PMLA function to the objects. If it's not primitive, uh, 
then derive plans for carrying out that act and do one of them. <laughs> and then finally, in a really naive step, believe that the effects hold, which is extremely naive because it assumes that all attacks are effective. Um, and so in building slightly more realistic agents, I just didn't tell it the effects of any acts, so it didn't automatically believe anything. Um, but what it should do, right, is among the effects, there's the goal, the reason you did it, and it should check with its sensors that that came about, uh, but be capable of fixing things if it didn't, right? But this acting executive is, is naive in that way as well. Is that clear, more or less? Um, oh, so I was going to point out that although the MGLAIR agents look like they follow the sense, reason, act cycle, it's really a lot more complicated than that, right? Because it senses, which means a new belief comes in, which could trigger some actions. And triggering actions is, is using this executive, which could trigger some more reasoning. And those reasonings could trigger actions. Um, and so eventually, maybe, um, it will finally finish doing what you asked it to do in the first place and be available for asking it to do something else. But of course, you know, what you ask it to do in the first place might be live. Right? And then everything is within this acting executive and, and right, it, it, it senses when it needs to sense and acts when it decides to act and, right? Okay. Um, so with that as background, here is one of these primitive mental actions that I mentioned already, believe. So believe P. Uh, let me skip the first bullet for a second. Um, asserts P as a hypothesis and then does forward inference on it. But before doing that, um, uh, using uh, some implementations done by Ari Fogel uh, for a master's thesis just a couple years ago, um, it makes P what's called in the belief revision community maximally epistemically entrenched. That is, as I'll point out, when belief revision happens, um, there needs to be a sense of epistemic entrenchment ordering. That is, which if, if there's a choice between no longer believing P or no longer believing Q, then you want to no longer believe whichever of the two is less epistemically entrenched. So um, believe P will do prioritized belief revision. That is, it will make sure that P is maximally epistemically entrenched so that when belief revision happens, it won't be P that gets removed. <laughs> because we want to believe it. Disbelieve something else. So, yes? Uh, when we ran into the um, contradiction earlier, one of the options for resolving that was automatic, is that what was Yes, right. Uh, is, does it have, uh, in, car, in your implementation, does it have anything to do with time? Um, what I'll show you does, although not explicitly time in the object language, mm -hmm. but, but actual time. Um, okay. But as I'll point out, um, the agent architect is free, well, I'll put it out right now. The agent architect is actually free free to write their own epistemic entrenchment ordering function. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when the system wants to decide between two propositions, which is more important or which is less important to retain, then they, it, it does that by calling a function, um, which returns true, this is at least, this is less than or equally epistemically entrenched to that. Um, and the agent architect is free to implement their own ordering function, looking at whatever they want to look at. So the value of epistemical entrenchment uh, is actually a uh, kind of a virtual function which can be defined by, like, a, like, a, like a function which can be defined by each agent. 
and there is possible implementation of age of an agent which can count on time when evaluating this. Yes, right. So it's 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 implemented by the agent architect, not by the agent itself. That's an interesting idea, um, right? By the agent architect, the guy, mm -hmm. person programming it. Um, yeah, and they can do whatever they want. I'll, we provide, I think, three of these uh, epistemic entrenchment ordering functions, uh, one of which I'll show you, one of which is to look at the sources. So you can explicitly represent in the language, uh, in the SNEPs la object language, um, what the source of this belief was. It may be some informant, some person, some other person, sensations, or whatever. And there's an epistemic ordering uh, function that takes object language statements about this source is more credible than that source and uses that to order their beliefs that come from that source. But the architect can write something else. Thank you. Yeah. How far will the forward inference go? Because it can be a chain reaction, right? You oh, yes. Key, yes. Key plus Q, key plus R. Um, all the way. Uh, we do have something called focused reasoning, um, which briefly you can you ask a question, um, and then new data coming in, if it's relevant to answering that question, answers that question and doesn't go looking for other things to get into trouble. But but it could just go all the way as full forward inference. Yeah. I, I take it this is the functional equivalent of the exclamation point operator we were using earlier, right? Well, it's, um, it's that and more. Okay. So the exclamation point operator just does forward inference. The believe act makes the argument epistemically entrenched and then does forward inference. So the, the bang doesn't do that. Sure, okay. Um, my real question was actually, is there a functional equivalent for the uh, dot operator? No. Would you want that? I don't know. It's interesting to think about. Yeah, there's no act that just says, believe this and don't think about it. Yeah. Uh, any others? OK, so now let's see the agent approach to the four-story building. So um, we'll set mode three. I'll turn on expert mode again. And this command says, um, use automatic belief revision. And this says, this is the epistemic ordering function I want you to use. And um, we've already written that one. Okay. And what this does is, uh, um, uh, make a fluent, a fluent, less epistemically entrenched than a non-fluent. Okay, so if it's a choice between two propositions, one of them is a fluent and one of them isn't, then it will choose to disregard the fluent over disregarding the non-fluent. Um, it still may be the case that um, you get an epistemic entrenchment tie and you can tell the system at that point consult the user to break the tie, or in this case it says automatic, in which case it does it arbitrarily. It actually does a lexicographic sort on the name of the wolf, which is essentially arbitrarily. Okay, so this is the most automatic you can get uh, belief revision. <coughs> uh, okay, define the frame on floor to have a slot on floor, define the frame location to have the slot location, and the fluents are in fact, both of these uh, function symbols on floor and location, because they both change, can change when the agent moves around the building. Um, and then you need to attach um, a PMLA function to a KL term. Um, I'll tell you why if you ask, but otherwise just take it for that. Um, and in a confusing, in a way that's easy for us, but may be confusing for you, um, they're both called believe. So the first believe is the KL term believe. The second believe is the name of the Lisp function which implements at the PMLA the believe act. It's a primitive act. 
So, initial situation, we're on exactly one of these floors, one and two are below ground, three and four are above ground, uh, assert and do forward inference for on floor one, and so we're on floor one, we're below ground, and we're not on the other floors. Then, perform believe on floor four. So the way in, at the this, this SNEPS interaction level to get it, the agent to do something is to say perform and then give it something of type act, something that's an act. And believe is an act, right? Believe P, believe on floor four. Um, so you say perform, believe on floor four, and that's it. The next thing that happens is you get a prompt, pretty quickly actually. And so at that prompt, we say list asserted woofs, and it says, oh, we're on floor four. Um, we're, we can be on exactly one floor at a time. One and two are below ground. In fact, we're above ground. Three and four are above ground. We're not on floor three or two or one, and that's it. All automatic. It just, now it believes it's on floor four and above ground, and it no longer believes it's on floor one. In fact, it believes it's negation. So this, so negation introduction actually fired because um, uh, on floor one was the cause of a contradiction. It was actually involved in this contradiction. That is, we're on floor four and we're not on floor four. And on floor one was chosen as the culprit of that contradiction. And so it's possible to derive by negation introduction, we're not on floor one. So that's all part of the logic and the implementation of belief revision. Yeah. What does EXD mean? Uh, it's, think of it as DIR. The reason it's different is from some arcane weirdness in uh, the logic R. Um, and I can explain it to you, but you, you may not be happy. <laughs> and, and, um, well, the Wolf 1 and Wolf 5 derivation is gone for, not on for 1, of course. Yes. But it's still there for the other ones, even though I take it Wolf 1 is now invalidated. Say that again. Uh, so we now believe not on floor one, yeah, so but we no longer. We, but we just no longer believe that we're. Um, on floor one. What? You no longer believe that you're on floor one, which I think was uh, wolf one. Yes, right. Because this year I, I'm just asking it to tell us the asserted wolves, and that's not asserted, so right, it's not it's listed. Still on the list for the sources for the derivation for not on floor two. For instance. Yes, right. Thank you. So there are two ways to derive not on floor two. One is that um, they both involve that you're on exactly one floor at a time. One is if you were on floor one, then you would be able to derive that you're not on floor two. But and that the has uh, been invalidated, right? What? But that has been invalidated. No, right? no, the derivation has not been inva invalidated. Oh, right. The derivation is still a valid derivation. Mm -hmm. But WOOF one is no longer believed, so we can't do that derivation. But if we change and now start believing we're on floor one, it's, it's there already, it doesn't have to be worked out again. Oh, okay. <laughs> it just reappears. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, and the fact that we're not, oh, now I know why. The fact that we're not below ground, right now we believe we're above ground, but we don't believe we're below ground, is because I never told it you can't be both above ground and below ground at the same time. There might be another way to be below ground than being on floors one and two. <sighs> Other questions? Okay, uh, finally, back to the delivery agent. <laughs> um, so here is a primitive external efferent act. This is psych speak, right? Efferent and afferent. Efferent is doing things and afferent is sensing things. Uh, a primitive efferent act with passive afferent feedback. That's a mouthful. Um, so sometimes we sense things without particularly trying to, right? The difference between seeing and looking, right? Looking is intentional and seeing isn't. Um, so, uh, at the knowledge layer, um, I'm going to define a frame for turn, um, and this is how it knows, so it will put turn in the action slot and the direction, left or right, uh, in the direction slot. I guess these are other individual constants that I forgot to mention before. Uh, bad me. Uh, my bad. 
Uh, so the system knows that an act is primitive because it has an action slot and the filler must have been attached to a PMLA function, otherwise it will say, I don't know how to do whatever. Right? That's, that's its error message if it fails to find a plan or fails to find the uh, attached prim action. So now we're going to attach prim the KL term turn to the PMLA function turn act. And here's the definition of term of turn act. So this is Lisp. If I want to turn in this direction, um, then if it's left, uh, call PMLAB turn. So the term, the turn implementation at the PMLB level, it'll use the locomotion modality, um, and the argument is L. If this argument is right, uh, again call PMLB turn. Uh, it will use the locomotion modality, but the argument will be R. Otherwise, it's an error message. The RESP is Lisp Arcana. Okay? So that's the actual code. Defining the locomotion modality, uh, and this is from John, so there's, we define the modality locomotion, and these are <coughs> one, two, three, four of the nine parameters. The others are, the default gets, gets left. So this is an efferent modality. It uses the predicates turn and go forward. It's used by the agent to move and turn, um, and it uses this uh, channel to communicate with PMLC. The PMLB definition of turn is, so this is at the PMLB, is, is execute. This is a general o execute in this modality um, and put in the channel uh, a string TN for turn and the argument is either minus 90 or 90. It's, if it's left, it's minus 90. If it's right, it's 90. Here's the definition of execute. And I don't actually remember one of the, what one of these lines means. Uh, but it takes uh, mod, which must be an efferent modality. Right, this is Lisp's um, uh, little polymorphic function capability. Um, and a, an act impulse. I no longer remember why this is. If, it looks weird. If the capacity of the buffer is zero, then do something. This one makes more sense. If there's a vacancy in the buffer associated with this modality, then add this impulse to that buffer. Uh, so um, at the PMLC and SAL levels, um, so Greenfoot is, is implemented in Java. Um, so at the PMLC and SAL levels, the impulse is removed by handle impulse function at the PMLC level. Then it calls the method bot dot turn left, um, which at the Java level here sets bot dot direction to the direction it's now facing, and bot dot rotation to the angle. Um, and Greenfoot works by regularly calling the act method, and then it does things, and so the next time it's called uh, by Greenfoot, it sets ahead to either R, W, or C, depending on the Java representation of this world, um, and it calls PMLC handle ahead, ahead, I'm, that is this value, R, W, or C, um, which puts um, ahead the string that looks like ahead dot whatever this value is, R, W, or C, in the vision buffer, actually there's a list whose first argument is a timestamp. But I don't know what John does with the timestamp. Uh, now back up at the PMLB la layer, this uh, vision sense handler, um, so the, the sense handler for the vision modality is the vision sense handler. Um, it takes the first message in the vision buffer, so off the vision buffer, and calls PMLS uh, function perceive vision, um, and it, it reconstructs a Lisp object from that string. So I'm showing you all this stuff because I feel that's what I should do in the tutorial, I'll show you all this stuff, right? But, um, so perceive vision um, looks at this and sees whether we're getting some information about what's ahead, some information about the room the robot is looking at, or some information about the corridor it's in. 
and calls either perceive ahead, perceive room, or perceive package. Oh, whether it's on a package or not. Perceive ahead um, just now translates um, these R, C, or W into the KL terms, room, corridor, or wall, and calls believe on it. <laughs> right? So that's the job of PLL, uh, PMLS, is to do perception. That is, take a sensation structure and add a new belief uh, using the Believe Act, so it, it actually thinks about it. So, ha, the delivery agent turns left. See, this is why I needed to tell you about a simple agent. Um, so, it turns left. So, it's, it's, right now it's, it's there, facing that way. And I'll ask it, what's ahead? Ahead is what? And it says, it's not a room, it's not a wall, but it is a corridor. Because I told it it's exactly one of those things. Um, oops. Oh, perform turn left, I tell it. And so now it's turned left. That didn't look as slick as it should have. Oh, well. Um, and now I ask it again what's ahead. And it says, it's not a corridor, it's not a wall, but it is a room. Okay, So this is a primitive external action, namely turn left, which leads to a sensation coming up, which is a passive sensation, because when you walk around, you don't have to do anything to see what's immediately ahead of you. You just do. Right? Yeah. Does this mean that the locomotion modality needs to know about the vision modality? No, uh, because the locomotion modality causes it to turn. And, um, well, I think at the SAL level, right, the, the, the turn, the lowest letter level SAL turn um, does call the what's ahead at the SAL to affect the bodily notion that it sees what's immediately ahead of it whenever it makes a move. So are the let's say, implementation details of the locomotion module and the vision module uh, coupled? Or? No, on a hardware robot it would just happen automatically, right? The cameras would be seeing mm -hmm. something. But in this yeah. Greenfoot implementation, oh, yeah, okay. we have to call this whenever we do it. So. Okay. Okay. okay, other questions? Now, um, here's another fluent, namely facing, so we'll define it this way. And facing is interesting because the way I've implemented it in the delivery agent, um, it's a pure KL sense of orientation. Um, I'll explain that as I go along. Um, but f facing is also a fluent, so I'll add that to the list of fluents. Remember, it's the fact that a head is, is a fluent that caused it, when it turned and a head is room, to no longer believe that a head is corridor, but believe that a head is room, because belief revision happened in the middle of all that. So directions. So we'll, we'll have a category of, of entities called directions. Uh, the directions are north, south, east, and west. And um, we're always facing exactly one of the four directions. Right? Of the four, these that are directions, um, either at least one and at most one satisfy facing D. And facing will be done by dead reckoning. If you know where you are and you know how you're moving, then you figure out where you are now. So let's um, define a frame called clockwise to tell it how the directions are related to each other. So clockwise of north is east, clockwise of east is south, clockwise of south is west, and clockwise of west is north. Uh, for all D1, if D1 is a direction and we're facing D1, see that's an and entailment, then if D2 is clockwise of D1, then the effect of turning right is to be facing D2. Make sense? Also, 
there's another consequent for all d2 such that d1 is clockwise of d2 then the effect of turning left is to be facing d2 that's all we have to tell it right the four directions um, the fact that it's always facing exactly one of those directions and the effect of turning is to be facing the either the clockwise direction if you turn right or the counterclockwise direction if you turn left So, let's turn left again. Um, okay, which way are you facing? And it says, I'm not north, not west, not south, but east. Okay, turn left. It turned, right, it turned left. Which way are you facing? Not east, not west, not south, but north. Yeah. You know, I just wonder what's the need output those negative uh, 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 well oh okay I, I have to because yeah. very often it's too many not yeah 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 I, so this I had to think for a moment because this was a decision I made so long ago I tend to forget about it um, so it, it, in thinking about how to answer a question um, it, it seems to me that the natural thing to do that we expect from people is to not only say what they believe to be true, but what they explicitly believe to be false. Eh, yeah, it's Flexible. right. If someone asks me what's on the desk. Yeah, you don't say everything that's not on the desk. Yes. Right. Uh, exactly. And sometimes it gets too much. Um, in, in a later version of SNAPS, I, I've, I've implemented I, th I think you can actually do it in this version, both, both a, a way to ask a question where you get the positives and the negatives, and a way that you just get the positives. Um, yeah. yeah, sometimes it's a huge... But as a KR person, I like to see that it really knows what it's, you know, the falses as well as the trues, so it makes me feel better about it. Right? Other questions? Okay, uh, facing rooms. Remember, the whole goal of all of this is to tell it, take the package from room 9 to room 11. <laughs> right? And it has to know how to go around the building and get the package and go to the other rooms. Right? So this is, this is all stuff that it needs, well, it needs to know at least the way I've implemented it. Maybe you can implement it in a more clever way where it doesn't need to know all this. Uh, oh, I should add, though, um, my basic approach to intelligent agents and intelligent systems is I want human level intelligence. So you may know a really neat computational method of doing something, but if that's not the way people do it, I'm not interested. Okay? Um, I, I worked on some project once of digital circuit fault isolation in digital circuits and students were working on something with a double E prof and, and so at some point I said wait how do people solve this problem and they said they can't and I said then it's not AI it may be engineering but it's not AI I'm really not interested um, so I, I'm not interested in getting intelligent agents to do things that people can't do <laughs> it's the other side of getting them to do things that people can do it's not worrying about things that people can't do. Um, so you can if you want, but not me. Um, OK, so in designing this agent, I thought about what I would do in its situation. And I tried to create it to be like me. Right. Uh, so, um, so we've got rooms. So the, the class of rooms and all these things are, are rooms. and there's at most one room that it's facing at any time. It could be not facing a room at all, right? But at most one room, okay? Uh, so here's a policy for acting active sensing. Uh, so it's subtly different from the knowing what's ahead passively. So there's uh, an act called read room number. Um, and it's a primitive act. And here's the policy. Uh, I'm an inveterate reader. 
maybe a lot of you are too. You see a sign, you wind up reading it. Okay? So this says, whenever there's a room ahead, read the room number. <laughs> if you don't like that policy, you could make it a different policy. But uh, Okay? Um, so I, I won't go through all the code, and you probably can't read this. Uh, but if we tell it at the knowledge layer, at the, at the interaction with snaps layer, perform read root number, um, then that gets translated into a read act at PMLA, which gets PMLB read room number in the visual efference modality. Uh, so execute uh, that in the visual efferent modality. John gave me these slides, so he can explain them in detail. Here's the... Uh, time tag on this uh, read a room. So it makes its way down to PMLC and down to PMLS, uh, which is finally a, a Java method in the Greenfoot uh, system to sense the room number. Um, and then it, it senses it, and it sends that sensation up through PMLC, uh, PMLB, uh, finally up to PMLS, perceive, uh, perceive vision, room dot five, um, and it calls perform believe facing room five, and then it winds up believing that it's facing room five. Assume, right, it was looking at room five. Right, so that all happens down this efferent modality, up that afferent modality, in order to do the act of reading the room number. But it's subtle because I have this policy that says whenever you face a room, read the room number. At some point, John said, I couldn't figure out why I was doing that. I said, oh, yeah, there's this policy. That's it. Oh. Um, so turn left yet again. Uh, now which way are you facing? Not north, not west, not south, but east. Perform turn left. Turn left now. Which way are you facing? So, <laughs> yeah, pay. Yeah, all these negations about what it's not facing, but it's facing room, it's facing north and facing room three. Right? So it turned left, and then because of that policy, read the room number. And now it knows which way it's, it's, it's which room number is facing. And by the way, because it knows which corridors the rooms are on, it now knows for sure which corridor it's on. Because if it's facing room three and room three is on the north corridor it must be in the North Corridor. As I said, we had a building like this. It was a really simple building. There were actually a couple of extra side corridors that went down the middle. And people coming to that building always got lost. Um, there was, uh, all the corners looked alike, right? Uh, perceptual, what does uh, Ben call it? Uh, perceptual aliasing, right? It was hard to tell where you were if you didn't really know the building. So. So this guy knows where he is because he knows which rooms are where. OK. Um, I'm just about at the end. So uh, I, in fact, brought uh, a file, the, the whole KL file, with me. So if you really want to see all the details, other than what I've shown you, I can, I can show it to you. Um, as I said, we've taken that. I just sent that KL to John. And he's working with a Greenfoot agent, so he just ran it on the Greenfoot agent, uh, that file and the PMLA file. And I've been running it on this other agent, the Carroll agent. It's the same KL, the same PMLA. It runs on different simulations. Um, so sub goals um, that can be used with achieve and goal plan include facing some direction. So achieve facing north, achieve facing south. Uh, and in Carter, achieve that you are in the South Carter, which is a way to get to any of the rooms that are on the South Carter. And some defined act. So there's the defined act turn around, go one step in direction D, go to one of the four corridors, uh, go to the end of that corridor in the direction you're facing, uh, face in the direction toward the door of a room, even if you're not right in front of it, so you could be on a side corridor looking toward uh, room one, which means you look north. Uh, go into the room, 
which is effective if you're facing that room, go to this room. Well, no, I think wherever you are, go to that room. You go to it and actually go in it. And leave room means just leave that room. Uh, so those are defined acts. There's also primitive acts pick up and put down for packages. Uh, now, oh, yes, this is also interesting. How do you specify a contingent plan? So this says, for all R, if you're facing room R, then a plan to go to room R is just to go forward. And if you're facing room R, and room R and room R2 are opposite each other, which is something also that it knows, um, then a plan to go to room R is to turn around and go forward, because the corridor is only one cell wide. Okay. So notice that um, this is a plan to go to a room if the agent is facing that room. Now, as I mentioned the other day, we in, in SNAPS retains lemmas. So if facing room three, let's say, were true, then it could derive that a plan to go to room three is to go forward. And that would be sitting there as a belief in the knowledge base. So then let's say we're no longer facing room three. Why isn't it still the case that sitting there in the knowledge base is the belief that the way to go to room three is to go forward? It's been derived, it's been added to the knowledge base as a lemma. The answer is belief revision, right? If we're no longer facing room three, then facing room three gets disbelieved, gets disbelieved because of belief revision. And since facing room three was a hypothesis underlying the derivation of this plan, the plan is no longer believed. I was giving a demo to a sponsor, and I went through that reasoning. Why, if I derive this, and it's still in the knowledge base, even though this is no longer true, why doesn't it do it? And it didn't. And riding home with my students, I said, why didn't it do, why did it work? And I finally realized that the belief revision system, which was implemented by Joao Martins, who's now a professor at Technical University of Lisbon. Um, this was a long time ago. Um, we had just added that as part of SNEPS just a couple days before. <laughs> um, and it worked out. It's just beautiful. OK, so that's another use of belief revision is, right? So in one sense, this sounds like the right way to do a contingent plan. But, in a, uh, but then if you think about it, it's, there's something subtly wrong with it. But given that you have belief revision, it's fine. So, skipping over a lot of other plans and definitions and so on, here's the bottom line. This is the plan to deliver packages. So, for all a one, R1 and R2, if, room R, if R1 is a room and R2 is a room, then a plan to deliver a package, SN sequence 5, in the, in the language here, SN sequence has to take two arguments, so we can define SN sequence 3, 4, 5, you know, built up from smaller ones. So how do you deliver a package from room R1 to R2? Go to R1, pick up, go to R2, put down, leave room. That's it. Okay, and all of these, well, so that's a defined plan. That's a primitive. That's a defined plan. That's a primitive. That's a defined plan. And they've all, it has, you know, this is hierarchical plan decomposition. It knows how to do all that. And it does it, and as it does it, belief revision operates, and it keeps track of, of its current beliefs and forgets its outdated beliefs. So I said to John, we have to show this. So here it is. So this is a PowerPoint, well, the keynote translation of a PowerPoint simulation of the agent going from room nine to room eight, uh, delivering a package from room nine to room eight. But this, this really does run probably faster than this is going to run. Or it is faster, because I, I put a delay of one second on each slide, which is too slow. But you can contemplate things as it's going. Um, and so John captured the, 
the image, the screenshots as it went through this. And here it is. So the slowness is due to my saying take one second at each, at each thing. What's it doing right there? I'll come back to that. What it was doing over there, I couldn't figure that out. I said to John, why, why did it turn around an extra time over there? We only defined clockwise directions. Say again? We only defined clockwise directions. It doesn't know turning left, south, east, east, right? Uh, no, it does turn Does left. it be able to derive that? Yeah. Um, well, I think we said turn, well, turn around is turn right, turn right, maybe, but turn, it knows turn left. I kept showing you turn left. Okay. Um, the reason is, I for, it, it was in room nine, so it wasn't in a corridor, it was in room nine. And then it left room nine. And it didn't know where it was. So I forgot to tell it that if you're in a room on a corridor and you leave the room, you're now on the corridor that that room was on. So when it got out there, it didn't know where it was. And so its rule for deciding what corridor it's on is to read the room number. So it had to turn around and read the room number and say, oh, I'm in front of room nine and room nine is on the south corridor and I know room eight is on the south corridor so now I'll move along to room eight. <laughs> um, and it, it's been doing that for a long time and I never really stopped to think why was it doing those extra steps and just tell it something that simple. Uh, but not yet, when I get home maybe. Um, so, uh, that's it. Oh, we're early. We can have all sorts of discussion. So, um, so summary. Mglare is an architecture for first-person reasoning online acting agents. Uh, it has these layers, KL, PML, A, and S, PMLB, PMLC, SAL. Um, SNEPS is, at the K, is the knowledge representation system at the knowledge layer. And it contains the representations of acts, including mental acts, control acts, external acts, primitive acts, composite acts, and defined acts. Modalities are individually limited, uh, mutually independent. The delivery agent is too simple to use multiple modalities at the same time, but John has some hardware robots that, that actually do that. Uh, so there are efferent and afferent modalities that go through the layers. Uh, the primitive acts <coughs> are grounded in uh, implementations in the efferent modalities. Perceivable entities are grounded in the afferent modalities. Uh, uh, and belief revision is used for keeping current uh, when in a changing world um, and in, for contingent plans. It's also used for other things, but in this, in this agent, that's what I showed you. Um, and for more information, bibliographies of papers, downloads, I was going to, I wanted to have SNEPS 2.8 available for download by the time I came to China, but I, it, it's not quite there. I'll try to do that when I get back, especially if people bug me with email. Um, and so you can download systems. Um, and uh, thank you. We have time for... Questions or discussion? Yeah. I feel like I lost track of the distinction between PML, B, and C. Could you cover that again briefly? Yeah, so PML, so th there are a bunch of agents that we've written um, where that are software agents, but the agent implementation runs on different machines, are not only implemented in a language other than Lisp actually run on different machines. Um, and so the communication is between PMLB and PMLC. So PMLB is written in Lisp uh, on the same machine that A and KL are, A and S and, and K are. And so PMLB handles the communication to PMLC, whether PMLC is writing on a hardware robot on some other machine across campus or, or whatever. PMLC 
it could be written in Java or whatever other language that is. And, yeah. yeah. Uh, the plan for delivering packages, was it programmed by the agent designer or did it derive it itself? I wrote it, yeah. Okay. The agent designer, namely me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, 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 told it, I told it too much. Like I, you know, I gave it the map, mm -hmm. where the rooms are, what corridors they're on, but it could have, you know, as it went around using Dead Reckoning, look at the room and if it knew what corridor it was on, assert those things. Uh, other questions, comments, discussion? Yeah. Yeah, it's more of a comment, I guess. Uh, I'm seeing more and more similarity between this and, and my system. I'm uh -huh. seeing the major difference is one is uh, uncertainty, which I produce from the very beginning. Uh -huh. And also, I think it's related to it's learning uh, because for me, what makes learning different from traditional reasoning is the uncertainty involved. Uh -huh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, I see you have mentioned you know, mm -hmm. it's not in the current design. Yeah. Uh, another thing is uh, resource restriction. I see uh, you take that into consideration, but uh, uh, yeah, it's a slightly different way. For example, I asked before forward uh, reasoning. Uh, I guess in a realistic situation, you will have to probably limit how far you want to go. Otherwise, you know, an implication of a new piece of knowledge in theory, yeah, it can be huge. Yeah. Well, um, so of course it doesn't do really stupid things like um, every time you tell it something, form all the possible. Uh, conjunctions with all other possible, you know, it, it doesn't do that. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> right? safe about that. Yeah, okay. yeah, but it's still it can do it can do quite a yeah. quite a bit. As I mentioned, we have this thing called bidirectional bidirectional inference is forward inference triggered by backward inference or backward inference triggered triggered by forward inference. That is, if you forward chain into an and entailment, it will back chain on the other antecedents. Um, Focused uh, inference is you, you can ask it a question that maybe it doesn't get to an answer. And in a sense, I don't want to go into what sense, but it, it, in a sense the whole knowledge base graph has been activated um, with channels that are aimed at answering that question. And then if you do forward inference and it matches part of that activated chain, it will then flow in that. Uh, but not look for new matches that haven't been activated. And so that's a way of like problem solving. You know, you ask it a question and then it, then it takes future um, new information um, as it applies to solving that problem or answering that question. Um, then there's a way to say, well, we're done with that. Let's, let's do something else. Um, and how you, when you exactly say that is not always totally clear, but that's another way of focused. Um, and so I have little demos that show full forward inference just spreads out, right? Full backward inference spreads out, um, but then this focused um, is like bidirectional search. You know. So that's another way it's limited. But, but you're right, we need some kind of resource bound as well. And by the way, recursive loops don't give us a problem, uh, right? So inferentially recursive loops, like if A is north of B, A is north of B if and only if B is south of A, <laughs> um, those get cut off. Um, but we do have a, a, a bound limit for infinitely growing terms, like uh, if your mother's a duck, you're a duck, right? Is Daffy a duck? Well, is the mother of 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 Daffy a duck? Other, yeah. This may be related. I think on one of the slides it says that all of the modalities have their own resource pool or something like this. Um, well, in the sense of this buffer, right. So, um, uh, so any modality can only, well, it can only do some fixed amount of, uh, of actions. I mean, so you can't walk forward and backward at the same time, <laughs> right? So, but you can walk forward and then walk backward, 
right? But you can't do both at the same but time. There's a no possibility for it to, let's say, close its eyes and cover its ears and get more resources for, I don't know, thinking on a difficult problem really hard or something like this. Well, there's this focus mention mm -hmm. mechanism that I mentioned before, but I don't think John has looked into uh, focus allocation between sensing, acting, and reasoning. Mm -hmm. So those are, yeah, that would be a good thing to do. There are lots of good things to do. <laughs> yeah, um, may as well. Could you walk through, like, if you had a robot with uh, a camera, for instance, so you have much more uh, complicated vision, you just yeah. get a bunch of pixels in there. Could you walk through how that would go uh, from the SAL to KL layer. Yeah, so the, the, the camera image would come in through the SAL um, and then move up, similar to the way this did. Um, at some point you do object recognition. And, uh, right, at some point a vision person does object recognition. <laughs> right. Um, but I mean, uh, it, would this be inside of the Glare uh, architecture or would you have to provide a computer vision module to sit between M-Glare and the camera? Well, M-Glare includes specifying, uh, I forget what John called it, but, but essentially a routine that affects the perception that is applied to structures that are pulled out of the, for example, vision module and then given to this thing, and that should wind up asserting some beliefs um, at the knowledge layer. layer. So that perception module would be designed, written by some vision team. And then would there be a possibility to have, uh, so you get bottom up from the camera to uh, the vision module to Angular information, would there be a possibility to get uh, top down information back into the vision module to help it for instance classify things within context or? Yeah, again, this, that would happen at the PMLS, but uh, it's too facile to say, yes, that would be available because I, I haven't done it right yet. You, I, you know, I, um, Irv Biederman used to be a colleague of mine, uh, so I know about the floating sofa. And the, you know about that? It, it, uh, yeah. He's done experiments on people. They focus on a picture, um, and they're asked before they see the picture, um, is there a, a, a sofa, a couch, where you're focusing? Um, and then he flashes this image, and if, if it's a couch in a living room, then they're really quick to say yes. If it's a couch floating in air in a street scene, they're slower to say yes, even though it's the same couch, and it impinges the same place in the visual field. Yeah. <laughs> Somehow. Uh, other comments or questions? Yeah. A follow-up for the previous mm -hmm. one. I think they have a lot of things to do with the uh, combination or matching between uh, expectation and actual observation. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Another related is uh, yeah. if we continue this example and go down all the way to the action part, and then you will need to have some real-time uh, kind of control thing in the system. Compared to the simulated agent, if it's a real robot, and the, the actual action time may need to be taken into account. Oh, yeah, so that's really interesting. Um, so the, the comment was the actual um, time to carry something out. So, way back when I worked on the FIVAR agent, um, so I was working on a simulation. That's how we started with this, take the same mind and plug it in different, right? So I was using a graphical simulation of the robot while this other team at a company a few miles from, from my campus was working on vision and had, had the hardware. Um, so I was working on a simulation. Um, and, and that agent existed in this room, space shuttle, um, with a few other agents, with few other robots and a couple of people. And so I said, uh, you know, go to Bill and then to the green robot. And in my simulation, it was fine. It went to Bill and it went to the green robot. Um, so we plugged the mind into the actual hardware and said, go to Bill and then the green robot, and it went to the green robot. It didn't work. What happened? Um, well, it sent this message, go to John, and the list function returned. 
And so it was ready for the next step in the SN sequence. So it said, go to the green robot. And it started going to John, but you know, for about one microsecond. And then it went to the green robot. It wasn't obvious to us. So I really learned the importance of body, you know, mind-body coordination, right? You have to know when you're done, right? Um, and it's even the case when you speak, right? You have to monitor your speech, right? People who are deaf have a different intonation pattern because they can't monitor what they're saying. So, um, so what needs to be done is not know the time, but you have to know when that has finished. So the, the modality has to report when it's, when it's done. And although I didn't list it as one of the control acts here, we have done control acts that are, uh, that go on to the next step only when the previous step has been accomplished. And so we tell it how to know uh, when an act has been accomplished at the knowledge layer, and only when it believes that does it go on to the next step, and that's got to be incorporated also. Yeah. yeah There's a co yeah. coordination between uh, vision or just perception and action and the reasoning uh, in timing. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. Tricky. That's right. Uh, yeah. You want to know when you're there and you know this is done and then your, your perception will confirm that right. and then uh, you'll begin to say, okay, yeah. after that I'm going to That's do right, that's know, right, yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. And this thing that I talked about, you know, I, di I didn't discuss it anymore about a symbol being a pivot between uh, modalities, <coughs> is, so think about using an actual vision system to decide that um, this is a chair. So how does that work? Well, so the vision system, right, so the, the robot looks at that thing and, um, and the vision system comes up and in PMLS it translates that into, into what? Into the KL term for an instance of the category chair. So how do I tell you that's a chair? Well, that's another modality, that's language. So I trans have to translate the KL term for chair into the English word chair, right? So what is the symbol doing? The symbol is a way to tie the afferent modality, the results of the afferent modality to the efferent modality of language generation to use the English word chair. And the symbol can also be used in the meantime by the reasoning system. So it's just at the middle, which is why we're drawing this as a circle now, um, it's just the, where all these modalities converge into formal sy symbols that can be used for reasoning and can allow you to come in one modality and, and go out in another. So. Um, Right, that's, that's the thing that um, uh, people like Searle miss. I mean, why do you call that a chair? Well, that's the English word that I use to call it, and I look at it, and you look at it, and we both agree that it's a chair, um, and so we're fine with that. So, you know, I have another colleague in the philosophy department who says, uh, when I say this is just a belief system, not a knowledge system, he says, well, then you can believe anything. Well, yeah, but you're living in a world with other people, and you know you want to sit on that, and that makes it a chair, and I call it a chair. We're in a community, we, and so there are ways to maybe not know that we're truth, right? That that it's the truth, but that we're agreeing with our colleagues in the community about how, what we call things and what they are. So it, you have to take into account in in a. I, in AGI systems, right, as an AGI conference, you have to take account in an AGI system that symbols are grounded in multiple modalities. And, and it's all about using all of those modalities together um, that really make uh, agents intelligently operating in a world and in a world with other agents. Yeah? On one of the first slides you mentioned as a motivation for Angular, um, uh, let the same mind be plugged into different worlds. Yeah. But if uh, these concepts are grounded in your uh, perceptions and actions and you get a different body, then how would you be able to plug? Yeah, 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 yeah. The mind in the vat that p people were talking about. Um, so modulo, you know, certain things. Okay. So what I had in mind was like with this Fivar agent. Um, I developed 
uh, and with, with the delivery agent, right, so that I can develop the KL and the PMLA using one simulation of what's going on, and then I can take that and move it to a different simulation, and assuming the APIs are the same, mm -hmm. right, um, then I can plug it in and, and, you know, and presumably it works just as well, except for surprises like operating in the real world takes time. <laughs> um, but that's, yeah, that's what I meant. I mean, in the real world, are the APIs ever really the same? I mean, then you would really have the same body, right? I leave that to someone else, yeah. I mean, uh, other comments or other questions? Yeah. Is there any facility for uh, knowledge compression? Like, if you've uh, formed a, a symbol for dog and I see fur, I heard dog, I saw fur, and then I, again, see fur, and I hear canine. Is there a, a, any exception, or what would be the approach to merging that symbol that was formed for canine and that symbol of dog and saying they're the same thing? Literally. Well, they're not the same thing. As opposed to just having a proposition that, uh, that, is, that is represented by those words. Uh, dog and canine aren't the same thing. But they refer to the same symbol. They refer They're dog and canine are that. dog and canine are words right. that refer to a largely overlapping but largely non-overlapping set of objects in the world. Right, well, there are a lot of canines. There are a lot of canines that aren't dogs. It, it, although all dogs are canines. The distinction doesn't matter. So it becomes valuable for resource. Well, okay, so the quick answer is no, not at this time. And, and the longer answer is our approach, my approach, our approach, um, is that any two symbol structures at, in the knowledge base that are syntactically different in the syntax of the KR language um, are different. At, at most, remember, they denote elements of the intentional domain. So at most, they might be co-referential. But they're never identical. Right? So a colleague of mine says, well, you know, 2 plus 3 is 5. I said, but if that were really the case, you wouldn't have to say it. I mean, 2 plus 3 is not identical with 5. Right? It's maybe mathematically equal to 5. But it's not identical. It's not saying the same thing. Um, and so if two terms in SNAPS are syntactically different in the structure of, of SNAPS, then they're taken to be not the same for purpose of substitutability, but they can be declared to be co-referential. And, and so the, the solution to, you know, Quine's problem, the morning star and the, is the evening star, is not to block substitutivity in opaque contexts, if you follow all this language, uh, but to permit substitutivity in non-opaque contexts, right? So, um, so the default is that there's no substitutivity. They're, they're different as intentional entities. On the other hand, A and B is represented exactly the same way as B and A. You don't have to, if you are told A and B, you don't have to prove B and A because there's literally no difference between those two. Okay, so once again, if they're syntactically the same in the language of SNAPS, then they're the same and they're used, it, that representation is used wherever it's a sub-expression. Okay? But if they're syntactically different, then they're different. Intentionally, they're different. Um, but you can say that they're co-referential or give other rules about them. Okay. But at base, to answer your question, no. We, we haven't thought about <clears throat> those sorts of issues other than what I just said. Yeah. I mean, the question extends to then how would you do it uh, if you wanted to say that A should always substitute B? Well, you could say it that way and, and give it the appropriate rules. So um, Albert Goldfein, who, who did his PhD dissertation in our group, worked on um, mathematical cognition 
uh, among SNEP's agents. So the issue is how do you, right, because the biggest argument I've ever gotten on this subject has been about mathematical issues. Um, and so he, he faced, you know, directly this notion of how do you teach uh, SNEP's based agent uh, to do arithmetic? Um, and you can look at his, at his stuff, so he, he, he did go through that. Uh, Goldfein, G-O-L-D-F-A-I-N, Albert. So if you go to the SNAPS bibliography, you'll find his dissertation and maybe a few other papers on that. Uh, yeah, I mean, my, my, my favorite example is um, people do do things differently, right? So we have the term square, right? So what's, now I've given it away, but, but be honest, right? Um, what's the formula for the area of a rectangle? base times height. What's the formula for the area of square, side squared? But a side is a rectangle, right? So base times height works the same way. But, you know, a square has the four sides are, are equal and the base and the height are different and we have different rules, right? We talk about doubling as well as multiplying by two. We have all these, these ways of dealing with the issue that intentional entities are different, although they could be co-referential or, or work the same way. Anyway, that's maybe a whole other discussion. Sorry about that. Triggered something in me. Took off. Any other comments or questions? Thank you. Thank you.